All right, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today here in the library and also at home, welcome. My name is Lara Villamot, she and hers. I am the head of outreach and community experience here at the Framingham Public Library. We are so thrilled to welcome you today to one of our summer reading programs, Backyard Birding, a first look at the birds of Sudbury Valley. And we are especially thrilled to welcome our guest, Ron Magato. He's an author with several books in our library and several books for purchase here today, if you like, and also the former executive director of the Sudbury Valley. Um, before I turn it over to Ron, I just wanted to mention, as I said, this is part of our summer reading program, which is a very exciting series throughout the summer. The theme is Read Beyond the Beaten Path. So we encourage you to read any book you want. We have prizes for reading books, everything from gift cards to Wegmans, to dance classes, to a hiking backpacks. There are all kinds of prizes available if you wanna read for the summer. Excuse me. And uh, it ends August 20th, so there is still time to participate if you haven't yet. We've got this person right here featuring one of our free t-shirts that you get for signing up. So we encourage you to check out other great programs that we have throughout the summer. And with that, welcome to Ron. Thank you for coming today. As we go along, uh, you may interrupt me with questions, but uh, my hearing's not so great and the masks make it harder, although the masks are welcome and uh, I support the precaution, but the, uh, uh, so you'll have to really punch your questions through for me to be able to hear them. I mean, so the, t the title on the screen uh, is, we're gonna, do any of you recognize this bird? What is it? A pileated woodpecker. We're coming back to pileated woodpeckers. Uh, as you know, that the title of the program is backyard birds, backyard birding, and these are the, this is the the outline. So we'll start with neighborhood birds, then, uh, and they're they're not, the categories are have fuzzy edges because some neighborhoods are going to get birds that you would see in parks and conservation areas, depends on the habitat around you and where you are. Then seasonal visitors, we have several uh, kinds of, a lot of birds that are here part of the year. How to attract birds, and then uh, a, a video, I'll close with a video of the ravens, coyote, that I was able, had the good fortune to be able to make one year. This, uh, this fellow is a, a true neighborhood bird, uh, an urban bird, the, the house sparrow. Used to, we used to call it an English sparrow. It's, it is a, 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 not a native bird. That's the male with the black spot on its chest. And here's the, a female that I encountered here in Framingham. It was, a, the, behind it is a young bird. And when at this time of year and in July, once the birds have left the nest for the spring, the young birds follow the adults around and they beg. And how do they beg? They flutter their wings. So you can't see the motion there, but you can see the position of the young one's wings as it flutters. And, uh, and the female is going in there hoping to get something uh, to feed, and, it, and she succeeded. So she has, she found something in, the, in this container. But I wanna point out this. On the young bird, see the bright yellow at the back of the uh, opening of the beak? I just learned this. Birds are one of the many su subjects that you can just keep learning more and more about. So I say I've been a, an, a, a, an intermediate level birder for 40 years. I, I, uh, I just keep going, but I never, uh, I never feel like I'm a great expert. Anyway, this I just learned. Young birds have that because it's called the, uh, their nestling gape. Because can you picture in your head the nestling birds with their mouths open so wide? That's what, that, and it takes a while. It's soft tissue that gradually hardens. Starlings are another bird that we see in urban neighborhoods and another uh, imported bird. But this one, this black bird is uh, a native. It's called a common grackle. And it has a funny combination of, of, uh, of characteristics in the way that it 
you know, the birds are, are just birds. They're all honorable creatures just trying to survive and, and keep their species going. But when we look at them, we see them different. We see them kind of as heavies or as friends or as beautiful. And probably few of us uh, uh, identify the grackle look with beauty, but there's something cool about them. E here in Framingham, when you look up in the sky, once in a while you see a great blue heron flying over, don't you? And because there's so many ponds around here. So that's a, a, a neighborhood bird in, in that sense. And then the American robin is, of course, we, uh, ubiquitous. And the blue jay. It's, I frequently think if, so we, because of their raucous voice and their somewhat bullying behavior at, at uh, uh, feeders, it's hard to think of blue jays as the nicest of birds. But if we didn't see them very often, we would just be bowled over by how beautiful they are, wouldn't we? The, the different tones of blue on their feathers. I don't know anyone who doesn't like cardinals and doesn't get a, a pleasure out of seeing cardinals. And uh, the female, of course, more subtle in her coloration than the male. Those, these eggs were in a bush in our yard. We live in the Sudbury Valley too. That's why I use that phrase. I've lived in a lot of different locations in the Sudbury Valley over the years and traveled uh, between them through Framingham many times. So Sudbury Valley is a good way of talking about this region where we are and these birds are all in the region. Now, what you might not realize, although, is that cardinals didn't show up until the mid-60s. And my, uh, my wife, who's here, uh, she's going to be selling, uh, selling books if you want to buy any of my books. They're available on the back table. But Betsy, Betsy's mother remembered when she, in Wayland, uh, saw her first cardinal. Uh, meanwhile, they've, now you might wonder, what, what is this graph from? Well, the graph is from an event in which I participate. It's called the Concord Christmas Bird Count. It's not on Christmas, but it's at, in the, at the holiday season. And all across the country, these circles have been defined of a certain uh, radius. I think it's seven and a half mile radius, 15 mile diameter. That, uh, and so the center of this one is right there at the four corners of those towns. But as you can see, it extends into Framingham. So Framingham birds get reported as part of the Christmas count. And the, the graph is the cardinals, it started in 1960. So the, the counts over the years give us not a sense of absolute numbers, like literally how many cardinals do we have, but the relative numbers uh, over the years is, is very clear indication. What happened in 19, what happened before 1960? There was no uh, bird count organized in that territory. Is that what you mean? Oh, no, they weren't. Uh, the, the, they're a southern, they were a more southerly bird and their range expanded from south to north. So before... What state in the south? I'm sorry? What state in the south? Well, I grew up in southern Illinois. They were certainly there in the 50s. Uh, I, and that probably, given that they were gradually expanding north, I don't know, it's an excellent question. I don't know the answer as to like when in colonial days, where were cardinals, what was their range and how, how is it gradually expanded? I'd, be, I'd like to know that and I'll see if I can figure that out, but I don't know that. Uh, blue, jays are, blue jays show up a lot on the Christmas. I, I do the bird count and I have a little, everybody has, it's all divided up. So I, I have a little piece of turf in the world that I count every year, and I see a lot of blue jays. Here's another bird that uh, the morning dove that often we, when we hear it cooing, we think it's an owl, and it has fabulous color, iridescent colors, and a blue eye ring. This is a loud bird, and it's a suburban bird now. Do you know it? It's called a Carolina wren, and if you hear that, it just its voice is totally out of proportion to its size. It's a little bitty 
Biddy Bird, and it makes, uh, it proclaims its dominance in major tones. Now, there is a three volume book. It's probably available here in this library. It's, most libraries have it. It's called Birds of Massachusetts and Other New England States. And it was written in the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s, by a man named Forbush, he, Edward Howe Forbush, who lived in Westboro. It has then some distinguished wildlife illustrators uh, uh, did the, the, pl the plates for it. And this is from that book. And it shows a group of birds, the chickadee, probably know this is the, the boreal chickadee. I've, they're way, way, live way in the north. So that's, I don't, I don't know that we have any boreal chickadees in Massachusetts. We get the red-breasted nuthatches. Some winters you see them at your feeders. Most winters we don't see them. But we always have the white-breasted nuthatches and lately the tufted titmice. So this group, let's have a look at them. Here's a tufted titmouse. It also has expanded its range from the south, so it didn't used to be here. There's the nuthatch, which is the, uh, goes down the trees, down the trunks of trees, and, and at the feeder you often see it upside down, so it's kind of wired to be upside down. And the chickadees, which I think every, the chickadees are friendly. We hear them saying their name, D, 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 I think when they're saying that, they're saying, uh, oh, don't bother me, go away, I see you. It's an, I think it's an alarm call, but uh, they sound friendly. Chickadees are cavity nesters. Some birds like robins and the cardinals will build their nest out in, on a branch, as we, as we know. And other birds really insist on being in some kind of cavity, like a nest box or a hollow tree. This nest box has a, a camera wired in it, which enabled me to take pictures of the chickadee inside it. She was sitting on eight eggs. That small bird has eight eggs. Isn't it unbelievable? The, I, I can't really get over how any birds can uh, accumulate enough, enough protein and enough nutrients in their body to then lay this egg, which is a considerable, a chickadee weighs one third of an ounce. And somehow she is able to produce these eggs. Now, of course they're laid at intervals, like one day at a time. Why do they all hatch the same time? Because she doesn't start incubating until she is finished laying her clutch. Because it's important that they hatch at the same time because they need to fledge at the same time. They all need to be ready to fly out of the box at the same time. It's, a, it's a quite a miraculous thing every spring how birds reproduce and keep their species going because most of the young birds don't survive and uh, then the adult birds don't live all that long. They, they're right on the fringe of survival but somehow they keep going. So the chickadees, <clears throat> there you get a, a, that that gape again comes uh, visible where they're going to be begging and we had to, so that was a successful nest. They're not all successful, but the cavities make them, are, are a big advantage in making them successful. And there's competition for the cavities, that's why nest boxes are important. If you get interested in birds, or maybe you already are and you have a, this is the a page from the Sibley guidebook, uh, the, and now they're online and, and tele, you know, uh, smartphone uh, uh, guides for, to birds, but uh, this shows, it shows what they call field marks, how you rec recognize the bird. Um, the white there is, that dis it, dis you might wonder why, they, why we care about that. That's the difference between our chickadee the, and the Carolina chickadee that lives to the south. So in the southern states, you see a bird that looks exactly like ours, acts exactly like ours, but it doesn't have what they say is the northern frost on the wing. And there's the range of the, of the, the archicotee.
Well, turning to birds that we see in uh, parks and conservation areas, and again, of course, you're going to see some of the neighborhood birds in the parks and conservation areas, and uh, so we already know we saw that we see the herons flying over. Here's a heron standing, a great blue heron standing on one leg, uh, relaxing. Blue her great blue herons don't have much blue on them. They're kind of a, a bluish gray, or sometimes they're just a plain grayish gray. But anyway, we call them great blue herons, and they are quite a sight to see. Now here in uh, none of us are kids in the room, so we, it, uh, you're all probably as astonished as I am that this bird that nobody ever saw when we were kids is now, uh, in some places, almost a nuisance in its, in its population. And here it is in my backyard uh, displaying in the springtime uh, the male wild turkey. Quite an astonishing story. At the other end of the size spectrum is a song sparrow. This is a native sparrow that has a black spot on its chest and some streaks. And this, so here's another black spot. This is an, uh, uh, a chipping sparrow, and it, I'm sorry, this is an American tree sparrow, and it has, uh, uh, it's here part of the year. And the goldfinch which we see a lot of. And once in a while we see bluebirds. Do, do, are, do you, how many of you see bluebirds pretty often where you're living? Okay. So they have made a fabulous comeback uh, since the banning of DDT since, and since people started putting up nest boxes. So it's, if you go to bluebird habitat, like a farm field or an open area, it's not unusual to see bluebirds today. Thor Henry David Thoreau said that the male bluebird carried the sky on his back. Do you have them where you are? Yes, and this, well, we, uh, like everyone, we have a very soft spot in our hearts for the bluebirds. In the last few years, they've co not come to our nest box. Uh, we don't live in perfect bluebird habitat, but this year we were favored and we had, uh, I'll show you a video of them later, but we had uh, a, a pair that was very industrious. They, she laid a clutch of four and then they, she hatched and we watched a lot of traffic in and out of the box with food. Both the male and the female were bringing food. And, uh, and then they, and they, they fledged those birds and then a week later she started all over, built a new nest uh, did another four eggs, and 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 so uh, we 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 can talk about our blue we're bluebirds for quite a while because we we're very they're they're charismatic not only because of the colors but also because they sit where you can see them they sit still long enough to have their picture taken <laughs> you know which is is nice if you like to take pictures of birds. Grackles uh, don't take, don't sit still. They're like most birds. It's really a challenge to photograph them because they're small, and they move around a lot, and they sit in the shadows. But uh, this grackle pose for this, if, if a bird will pose, I like to take its picture. So this is another grackle that uh, often along the water's edge you'll see grackles. I thought. I'd spend a little time on woodpeckers because they are easier birds to see. Now you'll find some woodpeckers in even in urban neighborhoods, but and then you'll find them in the big woods. Here are the pileated woodpeckers again, the the largest of our woodpeckers, and uh, this was during the Christmas count one year. I had an encounter that I'll never probably see again, but I sure enjoyed it. And they were so concerned with each other, they didn't mind me getting reasonably close to take their picture. This is two female pileated woodpeckers fighting. They were going at it, hammer and tongs. This is in the middle of the winter. What were they, was this the edge of their winter feeding territories? Or what was the problem was, I don't know. You know that they're females because uh, there's no red between their uh, crest and their bill, and there's no red over here. Uh, as you, 
So, and uh, they, were, they were going in and hammer and tongs. Meanwhile, I could hear the males and I turned the camera. There's the male, the red all the way down to the bill and the red there. They were like calling encouragement from the sides, but they weren't participating. It was an amazing uh, experience to see them. The pileateds have uh, benefited by the maturing of our forests as, as our wooded areas have uh, come of age and the trees have gotten uh, larger, that's good habitat for pileated. You'll see them on the trunks of the trees, but often near the ground. And they aren't terribly uh, shy. Sometimes you can walk fairly near them before they fly away, and you hear their voices, their loud jungle-like call. So the pileated are something. Uh, they're the, about the size of a crow. Yes, uh, huge. I've seen, oh, I've had some woodpeckers, but they're nowhere near that size. No, well, we're going to do see other woodpeckers in a sec. So woodpecker feet have two toes and two toes. And this, this illustration from a, an ornithology book I have shows different uh, arrangements of feet from, like, I think that's called semi-palmated, where they're, they have, they're not really webbed, but they sort of are. And the heron, big foot for not sinking in, swimming. So the feet, the birds have specialized adaptations. Oh, until a few years ago, I didn't realize two things. I didn't realize, A, that sassafras trees made berries sometimes. And B, that pileateds loved those berries. So as we have a sassafras tree, and one year it made all these berries in, and I could, uh, uh, and the, the pileateds came and, and ate and ate until they were gone. These are the uh, four large kinds of woodpeckers we have. Again, it's the Christmas count graph. And you can see that uh, the red-bellied woodpecker, which may be the one you're thinking of, is, is a new arrival, didn't come until the 80s. Uh, alongside our other large woodpeckers. Let's look at them. So here is the red-bellied woodpecker. A bird's belly is this area down here. And there is some reddishness on this. When I've managed Christmas counts and the, f the people uh, report their feeder counts, they say, and we had a, a red-headed woodpecker. Well, it's very natural that you would want to call this a red-headed woodpecker. We, there is a bird called a red-headed woodpecker we don't see them here very, uh, almost never, never. And uh, we see a lot of red-bellied woodpeckers now and we hear them, they're vocal, and they come to feeders and they're very strikingly marked, but they also are, were a more southern bird that's come north. So here's again that graph of their arrival. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Is there a correlation between global warming and the birds migration north? I presume so. Uh, the Yes. Right. I. Uh, it make it, it just stands to reason that it is the gradual re gra warming of the climate that has brought the so the more southern birds to the north, and we had, don't really have trends in the opposite direction. Uh, there's another factor mixed in, which is called the urban heat sink, that uh, the, uh, as, as the urban areas have grown, they tend to also warm the climate in a different sort of radiant way. But, but I think the, the simple answer to your question is, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> uh, this is a hairy woodpecker. Now, we also have the downy woodpecker, which looks the same, but it, it doesn't, it's not going to be on the trunk of the tree. And it, and it doesn't really look quite the same. Uh, so one day I looked out of my, my bathroom window, which is above the, the bird feeder, and I saw a hairy woodpecker on, on the f feeder. And on the other side, I saw a downy. And I thought, oh, oh, oh. If I could only get a picture of the two of them in the same frame. 
but here I am upstairs, I've got to get my camera, get to the kitchen, have them hold still, and guess what? They did. <laughs> so the downy woodpecker, you know, trying to say, trying to judge, identify birds by size is very difficult unless they're side by side like this. Because when you see a hairy, unless you have something to compare it to, it's still a little creature, you know? And uh, uh, so you have to have an, uh, I'm sorry? Their, their feather, their markings are really uh, virtually identical. The way you tell them apart is the, that a downy woodpecker's bill is less, less long than its head is long, and a, a hairy woodpecker's bill is longer than its head. So let's go back a slide. Uh, the, it just has a much longer bill. And when its head is turned down, it's longer than the, the head is long. Can you uh, describe it? I, and I was on my own, I would have think one was a female and one was a male. The males have a little red on their head and the females don't. So this is a female downy being compared to a male, but, uh, but they're, two different they're, they're, they're different species and they have different ecological niches that the downies are, are looking along branches and, 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 uh, and the hairies are working the trunks. And there are, there are a whole lot more downies. It's when we see a downy on our feeder, we don't uh, re make any remark about it. Uh, but if we see a hairy, it's like, whoa, there's a hairy, because they only come once in a while. Oh, <laughs> So uh, sh that question is, and I'm sorry, I've been forgetting to repeat the question, so I'll remember that. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the question is, is there a size difference between males and females? This is the area of sexual dimorphism, and, uh, and some birds are identical, like chickadees. I can't tell the difference looking at a male and female chickadee because their markings are not the same, and in the field book won't tell you there is. Other birds, it's quite obvious, like the cardinal. It's very obvious which is a male and a female, but not by size for cardinals. On the other hand, some birds, the birds of prey, do have a size difference between males and females. The females are larger. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure why, why evolution made it that way, but, and when you see a, a red-tailed hawk, if, it, if I see it looking kind of, um, tightly put together, I think, well, that's probably a male. But, uh -huh. uh, in, in the woodpecker f group, they, the sizes are the same, as far as I know. There's another interesting adaptation to woodpeckers, which is, you know, we're all familiar with them going peck, 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 peck. I mean, they peck for different reasons. They peck to find food. So we're talking about that right now. Peck, 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 and they, can, they know there's a caterpillar in there then they have to get it out of there. They have a long barbed tongue. So once they get to the tunnel where the caterpillar has been, they can spear it <laughs> and bring it out to their mouth. And their tongue goes all the way around the top of their head so they've got an amazingly long tongue. This is a woodpecker called a, a northern flicker and it, uh, it doesn't use the black, white, and red uh, scheme that the other woodpeckers do. But other than that, it's very woodpecker-like in its behavior, except that it's more frequently on the ground. It often feeds on the ground. Right? And it turns out it liked, uh, it liked those berries also, showed up in the berry tree. They're quite spectacular, I think. What, what kind is that one? This is a northern flicker. It's another flicker. The question was, what kind is that one? Woodpeckers are not migratory birds, but we have many migratory, many birds that we see here at one time or another do migrate. So uh, the seasonal visitors, the very, the one that signals us that spring is coming is the red-winged blackbird, and we start hearing it proclaim its properties in the wetlands. It's a, 
It's a very common bird, a very successful species. Uh, and it's not only on wetlands. Around here we think of it in wetlands, but it can be in other, in drier habitats out in the Midwest. After the migration gets going a little bit more as spring goes along, we might start seeing this warbler, which is a, a, a lovely bird. It's called a yellow-rumped warbler. Now, you might say, why is it called yellow-rumped? Well, th this one flew away while I was taking its picture, so it had been there. So there's the, that's, that's part is of the bird is called the rump. And when, when the, the bird flies away from you, you can see it. The northern flicker has a distinctive white rump, for example. When it flies away, you see that. And the yellow rump warbler has shown that. Then finally come in at about the 1st of May, come the birds that have come all the way from Central or South America. They start arriving here. Some of the earlier arrivals were really coming from the southern states, the Gulf Coast. And, but the ones that come all the way from uh, South and Central America include this really lovely bird. It's called a, a, a common yellow throat, and you can see that its throat is very yellow. <clears throat> I felt lucky to get this photograph one morning, and it, it has that black mask, and it, ha it has a distinctive call. I don't have a good ear for memorizing uh, calls, but this is one of the few that I can recognize instantly. It's, it goes witchity, witchity, witchity. And if you're walking along the edge of a swamp or a pond and you hear witchity, 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 it, it, it doesn't, sometimes it'll come look at you, but more often you, you recognize it by its voice instead. Yeah. The question, is that a baby or an adult? This is an adult. The, the new arrivals in the spring are coming here because it's turned out to be, since the ice age ended, a very good strategy for these birds that live down there in where there are many, many, many more species than there are here. How many of you have traveled to Central or South America to look for birds? Well, Betsy and I have. And it's overwhelming the number of species there are there. Like here, it's a big project to learn all the birds that we see, and, and most of us don't do that. I certainly haven't. But it's unbelievable how many there are there. And because they have habitat all year round, they, uh, they are densely, you know, the, the carrying capacity is much higher. Whereas here, we have a short season but there are a lot of insects in that season that, that breed. And because of that, that creates an opportunity for birds to time it properly to come up, build their nest, and, and have a lot of high protein insects to feed their young during that interval. So it's only adults that are arriving. Then again, through the miracle of, uh, of biology, the young, fly down, they've never been to the south before, and they, they know where to go, and they know how to live there, and then they know how to fly back and, do, and repeat the process. It's just an astonishing thing. Long, long flights they make, and, uh, but it's, it's been a scheme that works. So th they call them neotropical migrants, the, the new world tropics that they migrate. And the common yellow throat is one of those. Common yellow throat. It, yellow throat. Yellow throat. It always disturbs me that when we say common because it makes it sound ho-hum. There's absolutely nothing ho-hum about seeing this bird. But, but the common name is common yellow throat. And it, but mostly it looks like it's most all over yellow. Isn't the back is, uh, it, it's, it, there's a lot of yellow on it. The female, I don't have a photograph of the female, she is much more olive, except her throat also is bright yellow. So it's a pretty good name. The male has a, a lot more yellow, but his back also tends to kind of fade to green. How many of you recognize this, this friendly bird? Catbird. Catbird. It's a neotropical migrant too. Uh, 
and it serve, uh, makes itself at home when it gets here, and uh, we hear it. it sings and sings. It's very musical. It's obviously it's almost solid gray, a little a little brown back here, a little black cap. It's like a, a shadow that flies, but it makes its presence known for two ways. One is it's it sings. It's a it imitates the songs of other birds and does a beautiful music in the spring, to my ear, and then. Uh, it also seems very curious. They, if, uh, they seem to want to check out what people are doing and, and see you. And I've had one when I had a raspberry patch that wanted to dispute the ownership of the raspberry patch, so it would come criticize me if I was stealing his raspberries. But they're still around now. Uh, they, they come in the, about May 7th, May 10th, and raise their young, and then they disappear in the fall. I'm always glad to see them in the spring. They're so friendly. There's one bright-eyed. Cur they're a curious bird. They they have curiosity. In they enjoy eating bees as well. I'm sorry. I'm a beekeeper, and they like to just sit by the beehive and eat the bees. <laughs> um. Could you say that a little bit louder? So this is a comment. The gentleman keeps bees, which I've done also, and he said that when the bees can't quite make it to the hive entrance, the catbirds are nearby to pick them up. So the catbirds don't actually catch them on the wing, but they, they take advantage of the... And when bees die in the hive, they get shoved out of the hive, so they're probably taking some of those too. That's interesting. I didn't know that. This bird is called a red-eyed vireo, and it's the, it, it's the kind of bird you hear. You're gonna, you've all heard it. You didn't know it. Same happens to me. I, I have to tune in on it, oh, and, or use my little cell phone uh, thing to say that's a red-eyed vireo. Don't see them very much, and they're very drab. They, they usually don't see the redness in their eye either, but that, that's what it is. It's a, it's a migrant. Now, here's a bird that spends way too much time in front of the mirror. Uh, <clears throat> the cedar waxwing is just a spectacular creature. And it, uh, <laughs> uh, they, that behavior of catching, of catching insects on the wing is called hawking when birds, that, that songbirds will race out and catch birds on the wing. Some of them can do it and some of them can't, and uh, cedar wax wings can. So they, they will uh, uh, often be seen if, at, at the edge of a pond coming out from a branch and hawking insects. But here they're, they're eating, uh, uh, they're feeding in the blossoms of a crab apple. A, a classic neotropical migrant uh, is the Baltimore Oriole. Orioles <coughs> build nests that hang like this, and they often build them hanging over water. This one is over the edge of a pond, uh, at way out on a branch. One year, the, this, the female doesn't have that you know, striking black and orange, but she, uh, she does the work. You can see she has nest material in her beak, and she's building this. So this is a half-built Oriole nest that this is what it looks like when it's finished. Uh, once when I was, <clears throat> when I was uh, teaching middle school, I had a student who wanted to uh, do his science project on uh, a bird's nest. And I knew where one of these was. It was way up in an elm tree. So I got a ladder and I risked my life and climbed up and I, I successfully got it down. It was really kind of a dumb thing to do. But anyway, I did get it down. And the, the, I was amazed to find that the structural parts of the nest were made out of monofilament fishing line. That they are good engineers, these birds. This is a rufous-sided towhee. It says its name, twee, twee. And 
uh, a migrant, another migrant warbler that comes early in May and usually is along the edge of water is the yellow warbler. It, and it has uh, those orangish streaks on its breast and sings a lot and is very showy, lovely bird. Do you, know, do you know tree swallows? Tree swallows are the bird you often see over a pond if you go boating. They're out there catching insects uh, above the water or above a field. They're, <coughs> they're, they're cavity nesters. The barn swallows don't nest in boxes. They nest in you know barns or in caves. But the tree swallows, which <coughs> are diff have different markings, feed in the uh, 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 nest in boxes. So I have I put this box at the edge of a pond for one. And you can again you can see the gape here as they the <coughs> the uh, scientists call the mass of insects that has accumulated in the crop of the adult a bolus. It's kind of a, a lump of bugs. And it's you can see that the bill of the adult is down the throat of the young one, and it's about to expel that bolus into it. Are they all insect blue worms? Yes, they, they're iridescent blue. So the, 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 the blue in bird feathers is not a pigment. It's a pattern of diffraction from their wings. So it's an iridescence. And... Uh, if you see it from one angle, it's black, but from another angle, it's the brightest of blues. This is a mi migrant you see, it comes early-ish, it can kind of show up in late April. It's called a palm warbler and it's often on the ground. And here's a spectacular one. If you, if you do feeders and you have uh, a lot of vegetation around, it's not, there. Uh, considering how handsome it is, it's not very rare. It's, it's called a, a rose-breasted grosbeak. You can see that it's aptly named. It has a big, thick beak. The, the different bill shapes are adapted for different diets, and grosbeaks are seed, seed eaters. Uh, and the male has that amazing red form on its breast. I'll show you the female later. Another migrant is the white-throated sparrow, very aptly named for that white throat. And it, some of our migrants build their nests here, but some of them go uh, just pass through. And the white-throated sparrows, I don't think they, they might nest in the Berkshires, but I don't think they nest in our neighborhoods. But they show up in our neighborhoods, both in the spring and in the fall, as they pass through. And... And they're singing in the spring. They sing uh, Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Although in Canada, they, they say something different. They say, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. It's, you know, it's like... This migrant is winters here. This <clears throat> so this dark-eyed junco, uh, forget about that fellow in back. That's a, a house finch. Uh, but this, with the one that's in focus, is a dark-eyed junco, and it's here in the winter. So uh, uh, you'll see them until some date in uh, March or early April. Shh, no more juncos around, and then they'll show up again in the fall, and you'll see the first junco. You notice, you usually see them, they have white at the sides of their tail, and they'll fly away when you walk up and you'll see them, but they're, they're common in natural areas. Yes, sir? Some of the birds are coming from the south. Some of, we noticed in our area that some birds come from the north. In other words, northern birds that normally would stay there come down to our area and then go back north and start again until the spring. Is, is, is that um, something we can see or no? Um, could you take off your mask and see that, please? I'm sorry. Some birds may migrate from the north to the south. We found in our area sometimes birds that would be northern birds, in other words, Canadian birds, come down to our area and they stay there for a period of time before they go back north. That's, this, 
So he's saying some birds that from the north come down and stay for a period of time and go back north. I'm asking, is that one of them? That is one of them. Oh, yes, it oh, is. Okay. That, and that, that's the most visible, frequent uh, one of them, the, the dark-eyed junco. That's absolutely right. So it's a seasonal bird, but it's not the, the neotropical pattern. It's the opposite. <clears throat> I, everyone is interested in birds of prey, as far as I know. At least I certainly always have been. This is a red-tailed hawk. Here's a chipmunk's eye view of a red-tailed hawk. Now notice its, its, um, its eyes point forward. Birds that are... Uh, not just birds, animals that are predators tend to need good depth perception, which is created by binocular vision. And so they, their, their field of vision of their two eyes, and their eyes are huge rel relative to the size of their brain and their body, they have amazing vision, far better than ours. They uh, tend to be in the front of their head. Whereas the little birds, the, the, the prey type birds, are, have their uh, eyes on the sides of their heads so that they, get, they can see a great deal. Their field of vision is huge uh, comparison. So here's a red-tailed hawk that has caught a chipmunk. I, when the chipmunks come out of hibernation in the spring, I think the red-tailed hawks must do a very happy dance. And it's like, phew, because... What they find all winter I must, must be hard for them to survive the winters uh, with, with many of the small mammals safe under the snow and ice and the chipmunks asleep and them having to live off of uh, careless squirrels and, and, and those birds that they can catch. But, but hawks are, uh, birds of prey are adapted for catching different prey. This one is adapted for catching fish. This is the osprey. It's, uh, I think it's the same species of osprey all around the world. And here it is, one with, that's caught a fish and is carrying it away. They always carry them head first and then they devour them. This bird is adapted for catching other birds. This is a Cooper's hawk and you can see it's uh, bright red uh, uh, ours is pointing forward. This is in our yard. Here it is looking around. Uh, you can see, uh, look how big and deadly those feet are compared to uh, other, other birds. It has a lot of strength and when it closes those talons, uh, it's all over for anything that's in between them that's the right size. So this, is, this one has caught a junco in the winter time. They're here they're here in the winter now, again, to your point, sir, some of the birds, I don't know, like this exhibitor, whether the same ones are here in the winter and the summer. We know we have the species all year round, but do they shift, I'm sorry, do they shift south to north? I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I'm very interested. They have piercing eyes. Yes, very piercing eyes. Owls, of course, also are birds of prey. I didn't take this photograph of, of a man who had uh, a great deal more physical courage than I have, took it years ago. He's, uh, he, uh, his hobby was to put on pole climbing gear and climb up to uh, the nests of great horned owls and uh, band the chicks. Now, if you can imagine being high in the air with angry Great horned owls have are fierce birds, uh, and he was he really had some chops. Great horned owls are famous for being willing to prey on skunks. They don't. Birds are not famous for their sense of smell, but they do have a sense of smell, and most of them most of them don't kill skunks, but great horned owls do. So this again is the four bush series of birds of Massachusetts and other New England states. And it's the illustration showing it on a skunk for that reason. Here's what their voice sounds like. Could you hear that at all? Okay. Uh, I saw Great Hordell here in Framingham. This is down on Waverly Street. 
this is the view from the overpass over the train tracks. These great horned owls are plastic. Are they not real? <laughs> no, they're not real. They're put there uh, in a realistic plastic uh, as, as decoys, not to attract birds, but to keep seagulls from pooping on the, on the, on the advertising. <laughs> Uh, I don't spend enough time on Waverly Street to know how, oh, the whole idea is not particularly new. You can buy, you can buy plastic models of great horned owls for, for a long time for this purpose, but these, I had never seen any like these. These have swivel heads, so it gives them a more lifelike appearance because the wind makes their heads swivel around. And, and all other animals, every animal is afraid of great horned owls. They are strong enough and powerful enough to kill birds that are, uh, to kill animals that are larger than they are in weight. And they don't hesitate to do it if they're hungry. They, and they can keep themselves safe with their, their legs. But anyway, I thought it was very funny to see this, this pseudo pair of owls on Waverly Street right by the train station. This is a real owl. No more, no more tricks with the plastic owls. This one uh, is uh, in a forest that I was walking in. It's called a, a barred owl. It is, looks almost as large as a great horned owl, but it's not, it's not a, 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 an, a it, it's a mouser. It catches little animals in the forest and it's not as aggressive as great horned owls. It has a beautiful call. They, when you try to learn bird songs, you, you learn memory devices. And so the, the memory device for this one is, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Oh, wait, I'll do it again. Yep. Hello, play the sound. This, this is a bird that is found uh, all over, certainly in the eastern United States, I don't know about the west, but down on the Gulf Coast, uh, barred owls uh, here in Massachusetts and even to the north, also barred owls. This is a small owl. Again, the, the illustration, I've, I have the ambition someday of, taking, of getting a chance to, to photograph a screech owl, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, it has two color phases. They're called phases, which is a, mis, a misnomer because they're not a phase that they go through. They're just, there are some that are reddish brown and some that are gray. Uh, scientists call them phases for some reason. And they can, I think they can be in the same clutch, diff, just different, diff, different colors. They have very distinctive calls, the screech owls, and because they're pretty nocturnal, uh, the, the barn owls turn up in gray days. You can, it's not unusual to get a, a glimpse of a barred owl in the forest. And once in a while, I've seen a great horned owl here in the Sudbury Valley uh, perched on a, in, the, in the sunlight in the daytime. Uh, but not so. The screech owls, you don't see them very much. So they have that kind of warble and the, and the whinny, both. Uh, it's a treat to hear them, but we don't, I don't hear them very often. Wish I did. Here is an eagle. It's, uh, we, had, uh, we lived near a pond that had a deer. The coyotes brought down a deer, and that attracted the bald eagles. Now, I know that they show up here on the ponds in Framingham sometimes, too. I don't know that it, whether you've had them nesting here or not, but you might have. The, uh, the the recovery of this species has been phenomenal, and their their population continues to grow here in New England. There's the deer kill that it was on, and brought in several eagles. I never knew they could kill deer. They don't kill deer. The deer was killed by coyote, uh, but they were coming to scavenge from the carcass, um, which 
uh, the, the video that I promised at the end, Ravens versus Coyote, is about, is about that same carcass. When, when there is a, a carcass of an animal like that, it draws all kinds of, of birds and, and mammals to help dispose of it and, and recycle it into nature. Here's the Carolina wren. So now uh, uh, there are several different ways to attract birds. Uh, and the most common one is feeders. Uh, you can feed suet, which is animal fat. Sometimes it's impregnated with seeds. So here's a male downy woodpecker on a suet feeder in the winter. Here's a white-breasted nuthatch on a seed feeder. It's, uh, this seed feeder has just black oil seed in it. Uh, no, no other kinds of seeds. And that, that feed alone will attract all of the birds that will come to seed feeders. We skipped over house finches so far. So here's another neighborhood bird, uh, but also seen in parks and conservation areas that, that does have a, dis a distinct difference between the males and the females. A lot of, of red on the front of the male house finch and the female, no, no red at all. Well, goldfinches are yellow. Uh, that, that we have, but we have also house finches. Uh, that they both have, they both have the seed-eating tribe, so they have uh, stout beaks for cracking those seeds, and you can tell they have they have good tongues too. Here's this bird. You, as you can see, they're very. They've made themselves comfortable at this feeder, haven't they? They're not going anywhere. If a chickadee comes, the chickadee takes a seed one seed in its bill, flies to a branch, puts the seed under its foot, pecks the seed open with its beak, and then eats, eats the seed meat. These don't have to do that. They, with those strong bills and their agile tongues, extract uh, the seed without, without leaving. But I have noticed they drop a lot of stuff. <laughs> that a lot falls down, especially the goldfinches. They're very, very uh, uneconomical. That so the, the 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 chipmunks and the squirrels and the and the cardinals that are down on the ground under the feeder, are get the benefit from the goldfinches. Here's the rose-breasted grosbeak with his mate, so she doesn't have that black and white. She's distinctively. Outfitted though she has a, a bright white stripe and this kind of natty uh, uh, top to her blouse, but she doesn't have the. Uh, and of course, this is because she's going to be less conspicuous when she's incubating the young in this outfit, and he's going to tend to draw away predators. He's he's already uh, passed on his genes in those fertile eggs, and so that he can. He can be uh, more out there. And then evolution has what's called a, you know, a sexual selection is, it may be that there's no particular, that his, his outfit may go well beyond what natural selection requires because females like it. And so the more distinctive it is, the more attracted they are, to, the more willing they are to partner with them and so it, there's, I think, no way of knowing, even for scientists, what portion of his appearance came from the natural selection that I talked about first, and how much of it was perfected by the female taste that was called sexual selection. Hummingbird feeders. Now, in our house, my wife does the hummingbird feeder, and it attracts, we only have here in the East one kind of hummingbird, which is the ruby-throated hummingbird, which if uh, probably some of you do put the sugar syrup into hummingbird feeders and have them. They are a, a neotropical migrant. They, they cannot be here in the winter. They can't survive. They eat insects and, uh, and nectar. They burn a lot of fuel. And so they, uh, they have to have a good supply of food. They'll, they'll disappear this fall, come back in the spring. 
uh, that's all, that's an iridescent, the, the hummingbird, the spectacular hummingbird colors are iridescent, so it depends on the direction of the light what you see. It's only the male that has the ruby throat. Now, in the past couple of years, <coughs> um, my wife started putting out jelly on top of the hummingbird feeder, and it turns out that the Orioles like the jelly, as you can see, so that brings him in. And also the catbirds come for the jelly somewhat too. What kind of jelly? Grape jelly, but uh, the question was what kind of jelly? She's using grape jelly that is, what's the sugar thing? Not, not organic sugar, because organic sugar has some mineral in it that is not good. So she wants... Oh, it's the hummingbird syrup. It can't be organic syrup. Okay. Uh, and bluebirds uh, are attracted. They don't, they do come to the feeders some, and people say we get bluebirds at the feeders, but the nest box is the most wonderful way to attract the bluebird. So this is that camera again inside, and here's that gape, the nestling gape, opening wide to receive food from the adult. Gets very crowded in that nest box. So where do the bluebirds get their food from? The bluebird adults industriously go uh, uh, find insects in fairly low to the ground usually. You know, birds, birds know how to hunt efficiently at different levels. They have to find a lot of food in a hurry to raise these birds. Uh, so it's very impressive that they can do it, but every 10 or 15 minutes, they return to the high, uh, to the, the nest box with food. So here's the female. She's gray-headed, not so bright blue back, but blue tail, blue on her wing, and the red breast. Here's the male, the blue. There's the nestling, gaping wide. There's the male with food in its bill that it has brought. But this is the day for fledging. The other, blue, the other young bluebirds have left the nest. Now, astonishing, they don't practice flying. They get, I've, I've watched this, it just makes my heart stop every time. The little bird gets to the hole in the box and it sticks its head out. It's never done that before. It's never looked around before. Looks at the new, at the world. Uses, it, no, it's, everything is a new sight kind of, you can see it have these impulses, and then suddenly it just, it can fly. It, it has hatched and grown up. Now they do flap their wings in the crowded box, so they've practiced the muscles some. Uh, and then, and they fly up, and the parents can t keep taking care of them, because, the, and, and they continue to feed them as the birds learn. And, and, the, and the baby bluebirds do that same thing the sparrow does. Flutter, flutter, flutter means feed me. And they have a call that says feed me too. So they continue to drive their parents crazy after they have. they fly back to the hole or they stay on the ground? They, they don't, neither one. They fly up in a tree and hide. So if they stayed on the ground, uh, that would only, that would be bad because predators, they'd be expo more exposed to predators. They're exposed predators anyway because they're not as, they don't have the smarts that the adults have yet or the, or the agility or any, you know, but they're gonna get it pretty fast and they, um, and most of them won't survive. You know, that's, that's why when these, this pair raised eight bluebirds, but that's what the kind of thing they need to do to keep the population growing or stable because uh, a lot of them will perish. This one didn't wanna come out. So, uh, and the others are all out, so the parents were very, uh, so here it is, it's still in the box. Mom is up there looking kind of patient. Dad is trying to tempt it out with food. And this went on for an hour and a half or so, and then finally it flew out and fledged. But I never say all or none in nature. Nature does, the question was, do all birds uh, have both the male and the female feed the young? In my view, nature is not as good at rules as we typically think. 
And so uh, I, th I think in a lot of birds, the species cooperate and the, the sexes cooperate to feed the young. Some of them, only the female builds the nest or incubates the eggs. And the book says that bluebirds don't, uh, the males don't help build the nest. But I watched the male br br keep bringing pine needles to the box. I know that they do help build the nest sometimes. Uh, ours did. And then I think the female did all, does all the incubating in the case of bluebirds. But some species, they switch off for the incubating. Uh, some species, the male brings food to the female while she's incubating. Uh, so there's there's a variety of life patterns, and I I, I don't know them all. Oh, so. so here's a male. That's the young. That's a young fledgling. You know, they're nestlings in the box. Then suddenly they're a fledgling because they have fledged, but they they don't have adult plumage, and they don't uh, and they act like teenagers. Uh, Betsy said she saw a young of the year hummingbird at the feeder, and she said you could almost see the acne. <laughs> they have that kind of useless look, you know. <clears throat> uh, another way to attract birds is to offer them water. If, if you're in a place that has a lot of birds around and you have some bushes that, that makes them feel like they have a place to hide, then a bird bath uh, brings them in. They will. They both like to drink from it, and uh, and to get in and take a bath. So this is a female bluebird, and she's. This, I'm sure she has been working very hard and has earned herself a little a little break. Is that your bird bath? Yes. Isn't it like that's marble? It looks like. Well, it's granite. Uh, here it is again. We, we bought it for each other for an anniversary present, and fortunately our muscular young nephew was on hand to help install it. Uh, so the bluebird, you saw her bathe, but this guy is going to give a demonstration on how to take a bath. It, that is a Baltimore Oriole, a male Baltimore Oriole. He really knows what he's doing, does he? Yes, it was a summer day. <clears throat> uh, well, I'm going to show uh, this video that uh, around the deer kill. <clears throat> so it's early in the morning, but it's light out. So it's and these <clears throat> these two ravens keep coming up to the deer and the coyote keeps chasing them away. Now the coyote would, wouldn't stay there all day. Uh, it w there was a, gr a group of them and only, only in this case only one of them was out during the daylight and eventually that coyote uh, uh, gave up and, er, and walked into the woods in, in the rear there. So I walked away from the camera and deserted to kill for the day. But <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't that loping look like it's playing? It does, to me, I read it as, as it's, it's kind of, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure that the ravens also were playing because as soon as that coyote walked into the woods, they were on the kill and they could have eaten all, all that they could tear off but as soon as the coyote left, those ravens flew away. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you coming today, and if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to respond to them. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you very much. She, she says, no house rents. That is so true. We uh, have wonderful house rents in our yard every year. She says they have wonderful house rents in their yard every year, and we don't. They compete with bluebirds for nest boxes. So, uh, so I don't envy you as much as I would like to have both. They sing and sing, don't they, the house wrens? And their nest is all... Is, is, is all twigs, right? Is that right? It's we all. Give them, we give them their own house boxes, making sure that the hole is exactly right for them. Yeah. And we have to be very careful. She says she gives them uh, a, a nest box for wrens and makes sure the hole is just the right size for wrens because uh, wrens are, those wrens are tiny. The house wrens are even a little smaller than the Carolina wren. And, and house wrens, unlike Carolina wrens, house wrens are cavity nesters. And to my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, they build their nest exclusively with, piece, with twigs, which they have to somehow work into the nest. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, not easy for them to get, the, get it in. Yes, sir? So uh, he said that, that the chickadees will claim the nest early in the spring, and the chickadees in my house as well as yours use moss for their nest. So they gather up, so their nest is this pretty little collection of, of green, soft-looking moss. Looks great. Uh, the wrens don't like that, so he says the wrens take the moss out when they get here from their migrants. They're not here in the winter, the house wrens. When they get here, and they're, they're, they can dominate, they, with those long bills make them uh, better armed, and they can dominate chickadees, and so they chase them out. I've seen the chickadees and the bluebirds compete for our box, and the chickadees just hop up and down. They're so mad, but they, they can't do it. They, they're not quite as big as the bluebirds, so they get dominated. But no, we don't have house wrens, and, and I don't have, for that, I guess for that reason, I don't have a good picture of a house wren, but they're another bird that is in between, it's, a, it's a, a native wild bird, it can be in a fairly suburban setting or it can be in a more wild setting, but they're always gonna be in a cavity, like a box. It's nice that you put a box out. Yeah. No? except that great horned owl that, that was the real owl. I took the fake owl. <laughs> well, um, could you say that um, these sides are a combination of different places that you live in? Is it uh, Sudbury or? Um, I, live, I live in the southwest corner of Lincoln near the Sudbury River. Uh, the Sudbury River flows along the western edge of, of Lincoln, between Lincoln and Concord, and I live right down that corner. Uh, <clears throat> and um, some of the pictures I showed were, f many of them were from my yard, since I'm there and able to grab my camera if I get a chance. And, and Or sometimes in the spring, I've just worked where I could see that crabapple tree and when the birds have come to the crab apple, which attracts them, and when it's in bloom for the insects and the pollen and everything, I would take pictures. But some of them are on walks that I've gone on, like the barred owl was, uh, I've never uh, seen them. I, and uh, <clears throat> some of them I've collected over the, over the years. I used to be executive director at Sudbury Valley Trustees, the conservation organization, and uh, so, as part of my duty there, I had to go inspect some of our conservation areas, so I would take pictures then too. So it is a mixture, but they're, I think without exception, they're all from what we call the Sudbury Valley, meaning you know, just the area drained by the Sudbury River, but it's this corridor that starts. I used to live on the river between, between Westboro and Ashland there, right? Then, and, then, uh, uh, and then the river comes up through Framingham. And, 
where you are now in the Westboro Ashland area? No. It's the same. Uh, same, same birds. Uh, I mean, as a general thing, the, uh, it's the same variety. It, it, as you get toward the coast, if you, if, <clears throat> if you get closer to the coast, then you get you know, more coastal birds. We've, we do get shorebirds here, though, right? The drought has lowered the water level. There is a part of the Sudbury River called Fairhaven Bay, where the river flows through a pond, basically, and the river is down, and so the pond is down, and that has exposed a lot of, of uh, mud, mud flats. Along this, and there's a big variety of shorebirds there. So there's, that, I didn't go into, into that. Uh, there are a lot, a, a lot of things that can happen here that Fairhaven Bay? Is that what you mean? Fairhaven Bay is the name of the pond in the Sudbury River. Fairhaven Bay is, um, it's partly in Lincoln and mostly in Concord. And it is a, a wide place. It's a big, wide, wide area in Sudbury River. Very interesting place. Um, yes, ma'am. I uh, yesterday I was outside and I'm all excited because I think I finally see a bluebird. But it was a bluebird. But it looks like some a, a parakeet. Um, in my in the tree. And then there's a couple of daddies. Yeah. I took a picture of it. That is not a bluebird's face. It's a parakeet. <laughs> Isn't that funny? So it's an escaped. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, interesting. I didn't, you didn't notice that. I didn't see any kills yet. Are you familiar with what they are? Uh, I, so the place I was just describing, killdeers were there as shorebirds. There's a, I, I didn't get into shorebirds at all, but the killdeer, he, he, he's, he's asking about killdeer. Killdeer is in the group called plovers, P L O V E R, but you say plover. And they, uh, they're an amazing species, they, but we find them over pastures and, and, and big parking lots. They, uh, they fly around and we hear them flying around saying their name. They're very pretty to look at if you get close enough to them. And they, they lay their eggs, you know, and, and naturalists use that word cryptic, where the non-naturalists will say camouflage, but usually the, the ornithologists say it's crypt. The eggs, if, if you're by a killdeer nest and you look down and you're looking straight at the eggs, you can't see them, they're just unbelievably, the, the way those eggs are marked, you have to get really close before you can see the edge of, of a killdeer egg. Uh, so you have to be careful not to step on if you're around a nest. But, Killdeer come, they're migrants. They show up in the spring fairly early and they start making that wonderful noise. If you shop at Verrill Farm, the killdeers showed up there uh, this spring. That's where I, I saw them this year. But they have to be anywhere. There are many birds that I didn't mention here today. Uh, and it, as I was editing the show, I thought, nope, too many birds, too many birds. I took some, some out. But we have, we have, a, a nice variety. It's a nice thing about the New England area. Why? It's because we have a variety of habitats. You know, we have fresh water, we have uh, swamps, we have open fields, we have forests at different. What we what we lack in habitat right now is the brushy kind of habitat that you would have had when the forests were getting clear cut, when the forests were getting chopped down, and then they were kind of half grown back. There's a certain group of birds like indigo buntings. We don't have very many indigo buntings, but they do in other places. But it's because, or, or ruffed grouse. We used to have, not very long ago, a lot of ruffed grouse. When I uh, was younger, and, and I would, it was common to come upon ruffed grouse tracks in the snow, but not any longer. I think your timing was perfect. I think they're out of questions. Well, thanks again for coming today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.
thank you to Ron for all of your amazing information um, and all of your fantastic photos. Thank you all for being here today online and here in person. Um, we encourage you to check out Ron's books in the back. They're for sale. And we've also got some here at the library if you want to take those out and check out some of our other, other great summer reading programs. Thank you again.